just let me know in your greetings to uh, everyone present my name is ankit malhotra i am the co-founder and president of the jindal society of international law uh, the Jinnah Society of International Law is a student-led initiative which was formed under the aegis of the Center for the Study of United Nations under the expert guidance of Professor Dr. Weston Lepowski. The Center and the Society, in fact, as a matter of fact, was founded in 2020, provides a platform to young students of uh, interest in international law and legal studies. The Society was formally launched on the 18th day of November in 2020 by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, along with the university's Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar, the faculty coordinator and director for the Center for UN Studies, Professor Dr. Weston Kwaski, and also a dear friend of the Center and Society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The purpose of the society is to increase the student interaction with international law and other subjects of international practice and legal studies through its various initiatives and its various practices. It also aims and attempts to bridge the lacuna of resource by streamlining resources and inculcating an overall interest in the study of international law and its vast expanses. We aim to provide young students and, and international lawyers a platform to share their interests and also their perspectives on international law. The spring lecture series of 2022 entitled The Colloquium on Challenges to Global Governance and Humanities in the 21st Century offers a compendium of scholarship from the academy and professional experience from the bar. Over the past year, the Jindal Society of International Law has hosted over 100 speakers from foreign, renowned foreign universities, like the alma mater of today's speaker, uh, this is Cambridge University, and also the International Law Commission, the United Nations, the Institut de Droit International, the Hague Academy of International Law, and also the World Bank. Through our previous series, we endeavored to study the different contours of international law through which speakers cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of international law. Over the past years, the society has become a quorum of thought-provoking discussions and its engagement with international law has assisted greatly in this. Thus, as a result, through the spring lecture series, it is important to understand the law from different, different and broader contours. Acknowledging that international law is a creation of states, it is also important to understand and appreciate the social sciences and humanities that have played a key role in shaping the law. Thus, a broader study becomes critical and also crucial. Through the series, it is, it is, it is, it is imagined and it is hoped that one will develop a deeper understanding of Philip Jesup's magnum opus, a law, a modern law of nations and introduction, which he wrote in 1949, when he said, and I quote, so long as the international community is composed of states, it is only through an exercise of their will as expressed through treaty or agreement, or as laid down by an international authority, deriving its power from states, that a rule of law becomes binding. In those words, I welcome, welcome our speaker for today, Mr. Siddharth Lutra, who will speak on the future of international criminal law and Indian practitioners' perspective. Mr. Lutra was admitted to the bar at Delhi in 1991 and is designated as a senior advocate in 2007. He was appointed as an additional solicitor general for, the, for India at the Supreme Court of India from 6th of July 2012 for a two year term. Prior to that, he acted as a government counsel to assist the judges' inquiry committees in regards to the investigation into the misbehavior alleged against Justice Sumitra Sen, Judge High Court of Calcutta, under Article 217 of the Constitution of India, in the second impeachment after the Indian Constitution came into force in 1950. He obtained his law degree from the University of Delhi and an MPhil in criminology from Cambridge University. He taught law at the University of Delhi from 1997 to 1998. He is a fellow of the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust. Sir Luthra also organizes the renowned and famous international KK Luthra Mem Memorial Moot Court in January of each year since 2005 on criminal law in the memory of his late father, 
who was himself an eminent senior advocate in collaboration with the Campus Law Center, University of Delhi. Before I finally hand over the floor to him, I will pitch and petition that this competition be shifted to our university as, as something which his son will also appreciate, who happens to be a dear friend. Sir, floor is all yours now. Thank you so much, Ankit. It's a pleasure. Uh, this has taken some time happening, but that's uh, because of my lackadaisical approach and yet your persistence in making this happen. You've asked me to speak as a domestic uh, lawyer, as a lawyer practicing uh, criminal law in a domestic jurisdiction. You've asked me to speak about the future of international criminal law, which, uh, which is interesting. After Ukraine, perhaps a question to be asked is, is there a future of international criminal law? That's perhaps a question we really need to consider posing. Um, of course, things are not as dark as they seem, but there are legitimate questions that arise as to which way things are going to go and how international criminal law is going to hold the field. The fact is that no sovereign country ought to. The principle is no sovereign country can interfere with others, but I would say no sovereign country ought to interfere with the sovereignty of others whether it be physical space, individuals, objects within that space, the territories, you have marine territories, your ear, all these define what we call sovereignty and statehood. Now let's understand that domestic courts and domestic criminal courts, when they pass a judgment, that's within the scope of your jurisdiction because traditionally, all criminal law penal sanctions are domestic in nature. There are, of course, extraterritorial provisions, for example, with the field of technology, intellectual property, well, uh, information technology has led to extraterritorial application. Even in our own uh, IPC, we record that we have extraterritorial jurisdiction over crimes committed against by Indians or within Indian territory overseas. So that's the principle that we normally apply. Having said that, domestic courts are limited by jurisdiction unless, of course, people are found within their territory. And it becomes very important that due to the advancement of technology, interdependence due to technology, and criminal activities that are taking place which uh, surpass jurisdictions, it is crucial for us to understand that we need a robust body of international criminal law and entities such as the ICC, there have been tribunals in the past, which can enforce this law. After all, the body of uh, international criminal law is the body of law dealing with violations of human rights, international humanitarian law. And of course, what the Rome statute defines, we've got the provisions of the Rome statutes. There are commissions that have been done, there have been ad hoc tribunals, but let's go back to the history for a moment. The need to look at war crimes or international crimes arose post the Second World War. Needless to say, it was the victors of the Second World War who set up the authorities in the tribunals. So for six years of war, the military forces perpetrated great acts of cruelty, what we call war crimes, resulting in the death of about 60 million people. Now that's 60 million people and it is known as the deadliest and most tragic combat in human history. Now, one of the things this taught us was that, can we allow states to get away? Can we allow state actors to get away with impunity, with a kind of disregard for people's basic and human rights? And it taught us a lesson that there has to be a force of law rather than the law force. After all, what we see today when countries invade others, when countries uh, take over other territories, when they perpetrate acts of crimes against other civilian populations, that's the law of force. The first step was, was this recognition of international criminal law was the ad hoc tribunal. So you have the classic, the famous Nuremberg International Military Tribunal set up in 1945 after the World War II. 
And that was important because remember, the League of Nations had failed miserably to prevent anything. Happening. In the Far East, you had the Tokyo Tribunals. 11 countries got together because they felt that the Japanese had committed acts of conspiracy to wage war. Trial went on from 1946 to 48. And at the end of it, seven accused were sentenced and 16 accused were sent to death and seven, 16 to life imprisonment. What is important for us to remember is that there is a very famous man, ignored perhaps in India, but revered in Japan, a man called Justice Radha Binod Pal. And he's been written about in the recent past when people say we need to recognize this gentleman. He was the one who said the emperor of Japan, Emperor Hirohito, was not guilty because he, according to him, according to him, war crime was not an international crime at the time of commission of the offenses. And that was very important, and that is the reason the Japanese revere that honorable judge. Today, of course, we have, since that time, developed a series of international tribunals, hybrid, which we would call mixed tribunals, which operate both at the national and international jurisdiction. The idea is we must meet humanitarian goals of peacekeeping, anti-terrorism, social and economic justice, and environmental protection. I must also share with you a very interesting personal insight before I deal with the tribunals. Uh, prior to my joining the government in, 19, uh, in, in 2012, I was roped in by the then law minister who later became the foreign minister, Mr. Salman Khurshi, a, a mentor and a dear friend, who caught hold to me one day and said, we want you to travel to the US for some work. And I said, what is this about? And at that time, the government of India was having failed to engage with the FATF and coming very late, had decided to engage with the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Interestingly, the Global Counterterrorism Forum had a, call, a group called the Rule of Law Group. And this was looking at ensuring that in dealing with counterterrorism, even within domestic jurisdictions, we must have rule of law, norms, and human rights respected. And I must say that that uh, visit to the US, some work at Rabat, Morocco, and finally the Hague came out with the Rabat Protocol, or Rabat Memorandum, I've called, which are principles of uh, maintenance of rule of law. And remember, we had 30 odd member countries, including the US, including Pakistan, with both civil and uh, uh, common law systems. So the idea was to find a balance to ensure that there are broad principles on which we can agree. Because the idea was that we must ensure that in the zeal to punish things like terrorism or to act for counterterrorism, there mustn't be a, there mustn't be excesses, crimes against humanity, so to speak, or genocide or what are termed war crimes. Now to come back to the situation as it prevailed, you have the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, then Rwanda, ICTR, Nuremberg in Tokyo, I've talked to you about. And there were, these are kind of ad hoc bodies that came into be. We also had certain courts or hybrid tribunals which dealt within the national judicial system or an agreement between the United Nations and the national government, depending on their staffing, judicial composition. And these were, for example, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the Serious Crime Panels for Delhi, DILI, District Court, East Timor, and then the Regulation 64 Panels of Kosovo. The whole purpose of all these tribunals is that they were trying to deal with specific issues, but within a hybrid environment. What has happened since then is that there was a determination that we need an international body where there can be impartial adjudication of war crimes or crimes against humanity. And therefore, the focus was, if we have this impartial body, how will it work? Will it be able to inter uh, enforce the international criminal law. And therefore, in 2002, the ICC or the International Criminal Court uh, came to be established as an independent and permanent court. And the idea was to punish originally, 
to punish perpetrators of war crimes, individuals, and not states. ICC was not a party of the, sorry, not a part of the United Nations, but its founding treaty gets accepted by the United Nations General Assembly in a conference in Rome in July 1998. And it was formed to bring trials and punishments to those individuals who commit genocide, Article 6 of the Rome Statute, armed conflicts, crime against humanity, Article 7, war crimes and crimes of uh, aggression, Article 8 of the Rome Statute. Now, the whole purpose behind this rationale was that we were looking at, at that point of time, at international crime on the basis of the degree of official involvement of administrations or of state actors in the conduct that can be constituted into crime. So what are these international war crimes? Let's look at them a little closely. You have violations of international norms directed restraining the conduct of state officials, not really crimes by private enterprise, but uh, international crime, classic crimes or war crimes. Uh, you had the crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, uh, direct violations of international law, and crimes uh, associated with terrorist activity. There is, of course, also a separate issue, an understanding about how organized crime, terrorist crime, and drugs and money laundering are all interlinked, but that's a debate for another day. There are also issues of international traffic or harm to mutual or common interests of states, which require international cooperation for suppression of such acts. Now, what does the ICC do? So the point is so far, and the ICC acts as per the Rome Statute. I don't need to trouble you with that. You're all students of international criminal law. It has the ability to impose punishments, not more than 30 years, impose fines. It can direct for future of property. And there is a mechanism of that. But the problem is the ICC is a body where you have to sign up. You have to accept the Rome Statute and you have to accept the jurisdiction of the ICC. The US, as we know, their approach has been ambivalent and for reasons best known to them, or rather, we rather know why the US's approach has been ambivalent towards the ICC. India, interestingly, is not a signatory to the ICC as it did not approve the Rome Statute. They talked about, we talked about nuclear weapons and terrorism, but then believing or on the grounds that our demands were not heard, we have abstained from voting in favor of the statute. Of course, the Rome Statute has made the ICC subordinate to the UN Security Council, which makes it a political, politically influenced court in a sense, because the uh, permanent members of the UNSC have now got vast powers and, uh, powers and they can affect the function of the ICC. What's important for us to understand is India has its own concerns, the Northeast, and, perha and perhaps the uh, understated or unstated objection is that India's foray in the context of Jammu and Kashmir to put things before the UN is something, is a lesson we have not forgot. So we are rather wary of joining up and giving jurisdiction to a body like the ICC over us. But uh, I'm sure that is a matter which should change sooner than later. But there is an issue because of the role of the UNSC as to the kind of power and clout that the permanent members exercise. And therefore, uh, the efficacy of the ICC is sometimes not what we would all desire it to be. So, you know, when it comes to things like Darfur 2002, the Security Council says, please investigate genocide against Darfur Sudan. Sudan is not a party to the Rome Statute, but the Security Council refers it. So the ICC can excise jurisdiction. So these are the kind of referrals that make it a politically impacted court. And therefore, we are looking at international politics in a sense. From our perspective, you know, we are, uh, India domestically is very sensitive. And a lot of countries are sensitive because they talk about sovereign immunity. And there we have our provisions of sanction where we protect officers, combating insurgency, and militancy. You've recently read, I'm sure, in the last few days, that there is an attempt to take away the law such as AFSPA, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act from parts of the Northeast. Now, this is something which has been a long way coming. 
but these are concerns which india does not want to give over power over its individual actors state actors to the icc it seems and our belief is that we can deal with these issues as internal matters that these are not to be discussed over international platforms so the concerned persons whether it be the persons you know persons aggrieved in areas hot spots as i would call them believe that these are international issues because there there are questions which they raise about uh the nation that is india of course that seems to me a bit of a far gone conclusion conclusion but the fact is that's a concern um concern has always been that we believe that it's national jurisdiction which must be paramount and therefore we are reluctant to let the icc exercise jurisdiction over us directly or indirectly now there is one more thing which i want you to consider just in the passing we also have serious concerns of terrorism so today in fact in india we now modified the national investigation agency act to give it responsibility akin to section 3 of the ipc beyond the jurisdiction of india very interesting we're trying to give it extra territoriality the question is that can always be question or challenge by another state another nation but that's the fact of the matter and therefore section 6 sub section 8 of the nii act is a very important provision this issue and i'm going to just touch upon this is which shows that uh, the ict icc is not as efficacious as it should be is what is happening in ukraine the fact is 39 countries have made a reference and the prosecutor of the icc has opened an investigation of crimes against humanity war crimes where civilians have been killed and cities were invaded so there are mechanisms where we are looking at where we see that the international criminal law though not as robust as we would like it to be um, i'm sorry to <laughs> lot of disturbance in the uh, foreground perhaps from your sorry i end yeah is this better now yes indeed i'm sorry there must just give me a second perhaps there's a signal issue oh no no there will be there will be just give me a moment there is an issue because the wifi has gone off just give me a moment the wifi has changed for some reason my wifi has gone bust just 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 give me a moment. This is rather. Ankit, can you hear me now? Uh, it's is much better. Good? Yes, it's much better. I'm sorry, we had a little power issue with the Wi-Fi. You just switched systems, and therefore there was a little bit of a gap there. No problem at all. Did you want me to repeat that last bit I was saying, or is it no? Either way is fine, sir. Whatever is comfortable. So I was just telling you about the Russian conflict, and that's important. Look at the Russian conflict. Um, it's fairly apparent to anybody. perhaps even to a child as to what has happened there are there not crimes against humanity war crimes civilians are being killed the fact is the icc has acted the prosecutor has opened an investigation because 39 countries said this needs to be done but there is reluctance even our own nation has been uh, reluctant because of our dependence on russia 
are uh, dependent for various issues, for various uh, supplies in Russia, to be very vocal about what is to be done, rather than saying that parties should sit and resolve the matters. The fact is that people are being killed. Of course, it can be said in all fairness that India's domestic concern was that we first need to ensure that our students, and there's a large population of them, are protected and they are brought back. But having said that, it's important that bodies such as the ICC look into these issues because we can't have a situation of one country overrunning the into the territory of another and causing mass destruction and leaving it ravaged. Unfortunately, it's been, despite the ICC's functionality since 2002, it's been happening more often that we as a civilized world would desire it to be. There are, I mean, not that this is entirely opposite, but there are other interesting developments. We all know about the Kulbushan Jadav case, where the man is given a death sentence without, uh, in 2017, without consular access. And the ICJ in that case intervened and protected the man's rights. He's supposed to be, according to them, a person who was acting beyond the jurors, beyond the, as a spy or whatever. But the fact is there has been some move in protecting individuals' rights apart from ensuring that those who are offenders need to be prosecuted. Uh, there have been one of the focus of the International Crim Criminal Court is the activities of organizations such as the Boko Haram and the ISIS and the United Nations has talked about the breach of international humanitarian law. And this has led to the acting of the International Criminal Court on non-state actors. So the International Criminal Court, which is uh, without a formal link to state officials, has intervened for protection of people's fundamental rights on the basis that members of state security forces commit crimes. And this shows a shift from the traditional approach that focused only on states and, and nations. So if you look at Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, in all these cases, you have only non-state actors typically linked to rebel groupings. And in case of war, war conflicts, if the ICC was to reject jurisdiction, then perhaps there would be very little work for the ICC left to do. And therefore, it's important. There are, of course, as I said even earlier, problems confronting us and problems confronting the international criminal law. One of the issues is, how do you impose restraints on the conduct of those who breach? How do you impose um, restraints or uh, penalize those who are protected by the state actors and state official authorities? Secondly, depending on the nature of the crime, there are histories, there are conflicts between nations, and these investigations and these prosecutions become much more complex. So how do you deal with the complexity of these issues where there are different variant thoughts about these? Thirdly, states which are suffering armed conflict are rarely able to meet their obligations under international humanitarian law. And that's the place they're unable to protect the fundamental rights of individuals. And because they're not, perhaps that's the place where the ICC is very important. Insofar as the future is concerned, I will say this. International law, international humanitarian law, and there's a mingling of criminal law and international humanitarian law and concepts, is in an unstable world, and the world is not as stable as it should be, is important, but it cannot alone be relied upon to be the sole guardian of rights and protection of liberty of individuals' rights. The ICC can contribute and does contribute in the stability in states weakened by armed conflicts, as I said, where there are rebellious groups like Boko Haram, ICS, because they fill in the vacuum of what we call is states which are weak or perhaps even failed states. This, new, this focus on non-state actors ensure that there is protection to those who face aggression and the civilians, especially, who are facing aggression from these non-state actors, whether linked to the state or not, the individuals. And as I said earlier, 
the merging of international human rights law, humanitarian law, international criminal law. That is the way of the future. We have to consider the dignity, the safety of individuals. We have to see those who are left in a vulnerable position because if the state fails, as a responsible world, as a body of nations, we must not face, uh, fail those who deserve the protection of the international community. In December 2017, it's important that the state guard parties have agreed to vest the ICC with jurisdiction of the crime of aggression. So I would say that despite the failings that we see occasionally in the functionality of the International Criminal Court and International Criminal Law, there are small steps or specific distinct steps which are being made, which are taking us to a better future. We are in an imperfect world. And in an imperfect world, what is very clear is that there are going to be concerns about how different players let the ICC function, let the international criminal law operate. But at the same time, what we have achieved in the last two decades from 2002 onwards now, actually four decades, I would say, sorry, has been not baby steps, but large steps. A lot has to be done, but in a polarized world, I think what we are looking at is a better future for those whose rights are otherwise unprotected. So I'm going to close with that. Thank you. I hope uh, I've uh, tried to convey what my understanding of the future of international criminal law is. And it's not, as I would say, is there a future of international criminal law? There is. But your generation will have to work much harder to make sure that it's a little more robust and a rosier future, if I may say that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just offer a few reflections. Uh, first, let me just start off by uh, thanking you for your quite remarkable address. Uh, I was I was recently in, 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 in the spare time, I do find uh, stumbled upon an account wherein this, this civil servant served in Japan. And he said he shares his account and he resonates with what you shared that Japan, Japanese recognize three things in India, food, culture, and then just this pal. They even have a statue of him in a, in a nook, which and, and this sort of inspires them to, to, to reflect on what India is and also the core values and tenets in which our country finds itself, not, which is not only just, just Gandhi, but others also who've questioned the law and also the status of the law. Uh, let me just proceed to to a few questions which which have uh, which which have mo which have been motivated uh, to me by by your address. First, being the following: uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, Arundhati Roy had written an article for the Wire wherein she entitled the pandemic as as a crime against humanity. Now, <clears throat> as a, as an author, it sounds quite flowery, if I may say so. But uh, uh, let me just offer a sort of a reflection on that and that come to you. I'll also pose a question afterwards after this as well, and then you can address them collectively. So the, the reflection which I just want to offer on this front is that uh, the, the international criminal law has only served to powerful governments as a way of avoiding a real responsibility or response to the structural aspects of human rights violations. Human rights law actually poses a compelling alternative to think of these questions as the one which is posed by Madam Roy. Uh, but there is a strong case that can be made against the Indian government and also the establishment. But I require you to sort of niche pick this from your criminal, criminal lens to make a case of this, whether this has any substantial weight or not. But, but before I do that, uh, let me just also say that states are, as the Committee of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights recently stressed, under an obligation to take measures to prevent or at least mitigate the adverse impacts on the enjoyment of human rights, including the right to, to health. And to that front, let me just add that, as Lord, Lord Sankey had once said in the Canadian Constitutional Court, he said that that 
he said this in the constitution perspective, but perhaps it's true for all laws that law is not a living instrument as in a violin. It's actually a living tree. It branches out and it expands in this natural and organic sense. And that's, I found that quite enlightening and quite illuminating. Uh, so that just being question number one, uh, I'll pose the second question now itself, which is with respect to Ukraine, to which you've referred repeatedly, what a discussion which has transpired with, in, in my mind, with, and also because of my father and his practices, in the human trafficking aspect of it, and how adversely it will impact the entire region. And let's not forget, it's just been three months into 2022, we've already seen the fall of Afghanistan. We've also seen Ukraine. So how the criminal aspects of drug trafficking, of, of human trafficking as well, is something which, which I remain quite, quite uh, concerned about. And the last question I'd like to pose is with respect to Mr. Jadav. While the ICJ has, has given justice or whatever that means, he still languishes in the jails in Pakistan. Pakistan, which has nonetheless passed a, passed a bill in its parliament to allow for a, for a retrial of some sense and, and have a Pakistani prosecutor to which, to which India says that, no, we want an Indian there. Uh, do, do we, is there anything, is there anything that we can actually do? Can we send an Indian uh, or, or, or a, a battalion of Indians? Is there any merit in this? Should, should we see a Kasab commission as there was during Kasab's time? And are you willing to go? Does that make, does that help in the cause, which is a noble cause, not only for the life, but also for the rule of law as a larger and perhaps more abstract concept? So I think you've asked, you've asked me three very long questions. I think I've forgotten the first, but I'll start with the last. Then we'll come to Ukraine, and then you'll have to remind me of the first question again because you've given me a lot. Uh, so let no, let's start with the first one on a more serious note. So uh, Miss Roy has uh, makes a compelling case for crimes against humanity, but then the question is, can we elevate it to a um, crime against humanity or is it an unprecedented breakdown of our governance and for which we have a domestic legislation which is the Epidemic Disease Act and the Disaster Management Act. It would be another issue if you could link the virus to a man-made virus arising from the labs in China, and to say that it was deliberately leaked on that would definitely, in my view, constitute a crime against humanity. Um, Ms. Roy is a very learned person and an eminent writer, but uh, you and I are constrained by the scope of laws as students of the law, and I'm still very much a student of the law, of the criminal law, that we have to understand, can we fit it? Can we elevate it to the status of a crime against humanity? Mm, perhaps not, that's my view. The second thing is deplorable situation, breakdown of health. I mean, uh, can we say that the fact that for years we let our health systems crumble, were they crimes against humanity, on the migrants that we let them move, can we call it crime against humanity? Mismanagement, poor governance, yes. Deaths, yes. But then I think that's something which we've not looked at illustratively. I would say, you know, the if you go to the wills, uh, villages in the hills of North India, you will find ghost villages. That's because you have had a certain developmental model which led to a movement from the rural areas back to towns and now, of course, the consequences, people have sought to go back to their villages because you, if you don't give them employment, education, health care, well, where are they going to stay? I have a home in the hills, which is about uh, 20 kilometers from the state capital. There are people who live uh, down the road from us a couple of kilometers away till about eight years ago. Seven, no, six or seven years ago, they didn't have a motorable road from their village. So if somebody fell ill in the village, they would have to walk 
seven kilometers up from their village in the valley, up to Masuri town, where there was a civil hospital, which is not functional for the past 10 years. It's now become functional in the last two years. So these are issues which are poor governance, not necessarily crimes against humanity. The second issue was uh, Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, we've, it's actually disturbing as to the way things have panned out. And the fact that the international community has done little in its power other than random sanctions to stop the Russians, a member, a permanent member of the Security Council. In fact, it's reached a point where people, where the debate in the international community is, that if this can happen to Ukraine, what is going to happen to Taiwan? Because the South China Sea is now open and the Americans are retreating. So really the problem with international criminal law and situations like this is that at one level, might is right. It's easy for the strong or the better place to enforce international criminal law on the less better place. And that is the reality of international criminal law, which we need to address at a larger plane. And that was going to take a few decades, if maybe not in my lifetime, but definitely in yours. The third thing which you said was about the human trafficking angle. Now, you know, there is any armed conflict, whether in Afghanistan or in the Ukraine, is going to deal with displacement of a large number of people and great acts of cruelty uh, to the civilian population, irrespective of where the civilian targets are uh, civilian uh, institutions and individuals are targeted or not. And of course, the issue of human trafficking. That is a tragic reality which we need to address even as the war goes on. What is very clear, as you've noted, is the war is not going to stop in the next, very in the very near future. But if it's not going to stop, then we need to be very, very clear that we need to address these issues to ensure that as the war goes on, the collateral damage to the to individuals is minimized and the international community comes forth. I don't know if you recall, but when there were, uh, when the um, Talib, when the Russians came in to Af Afghanistan many, many years ago, and that's been a very troubled country for a, almost a hundred few decades now, when the Russians came in, India gave a lot of succor and to a lot of uh, Afghan refugees. First, we gave it to the Iranians, then to the Afghans, and then we have protected, we have, and the UN stepped in, the UNHCR stepped in, and they were provided alternate uh, residences and alternate accommodation and alternate uh, employment, and they were put on financial benefits so that they could sustain themselves and they were not subjected, those that had been able to flee. But the reality is that we are only able to help those who escape these troubled areas. And it's a living hell for those who remain behind till things stabilize. That's something that needs addressing definitely. And it is important that the international community act in a robust manner What's interesting also is that the consequences of this trafficking are not, uh, are not limited to international crimes alone, because the consequences are felt within other domestic or become apparent in other domestic jurisdictions. And therefore, even as uh, we find the ICC not being able to do enough in the domestic jurisdictions where the impact where these uh, individuals who are subjected to human trafficking are being taken or being kept or being um, physically or mentally abused, those jurisdictions are in a position to use their domestic laws because that's within their territory and then act and ensure that the human rights and the life and liberty of such individuals is protected. 
and on uh, Jadav. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Where, where, where do we stand Jadav. on Jadav? And, uh, I left out Jadav. That was my lapse. Too many questions, Ankit, in one lot for a feeble brain like mine. No, no, no. Jadav, on Jadav, listen. Remember, at heart, I'm a trial defense lawyer. I am happy to fight on the side of the uh, underdog anytime. And the poor man is an underdog. The problem that happens is, in fact, when the ICJ uh, orders came, it was a very bold judgment, a lot of people believe, because the question was whether the ICJ actually would had or would exercise jurisdiction at all. It did. Having said that, since Mr. Jadav has been tried by a domestic court in Pakistan, it's domestic jurisdiction. And there is only so much the ICJ can do to enforce uh, the rights that we seek. You're right, we are right now struggling with him on the issue as to who will prosecute. Will Pakistan allow an Indian prosecutor Unless there are very strong sanctions, I think not. Having said that, what is important and I believe is crucial for us to understand is that even if we get observing rights to determine the fairness of the trial or rights to uh, be able to support him adequately, I think if we get international observers in, that may perhaps be very important and a development in the field of international criminal. But I'm, willing to go. I'm happy and willing to go any time, provided the opportunity comes. It doesn't. Uh, it does help matters that uh, I have learned to read and write Urdu in the last uh, couple of years, and uh, the, the language spoken in that part of the country is that part of the world is something which I'm. The dialect is something which I'm familiar with. Having been brought up, being a child of refugee parents, parents were refugees. Let me just focus on one of the points which you made with respect to Jadav. As you say that even the court taking up jurisdiction was a bold step. But in the separate opinions of these judges and the critique offered to that is, and the separate judges in their, in their, in their opinions also agree with this, is that the court missed an opportunity to lay down the right of a fair trial as a common principle of not only law but also not only international law but as law as well as a right to fair trial being an important and integral asset of this so i'd be interested to know who your perspective is on this vis-a-vis -vis the condition in let's say india where people are people are not even getting bail and these people being very very ordinary persons or persons who believe in a certain cause which goes against the status quo or or the thinking on alignment of india uh, of the government. And also, perhaps then it would be even more surprising for a practitioner like you that Ukraine, that provisional measures have been issued uh, in the favor of Ukraine by the ICJ. So is this then a dawn of international jurisprudence which respects and reveres these principles? Or is this a false dawn? So you asked me multiple questions. Perhaps you should be on the bench. You would do well. <laughs> That's what I have to face often enough. Maybe you will be sooner than later. Now, let me, let me just respond to that statement. The first issue is, did the ICJ do enough? I think it was a step forward. Could it have done more? The answer is obviously yes. But is it a dawn? Yes, I believe it is. I think it's a movement in the right direction. The second issue is, what about, you mentioned jurisdictions like India, where you said people don't get bail. The failure to grant bail is not a executive failure. That's, that's a, a reflection on how our criminal justice administration works. Professor Bakshi, my very, very eminent teacher, who's one of the most eminent law professors, makes it clear that it's not the criminal justice system at work. He calls it the administration of criminal justice because he says he has concerns about how the system, if it is a system at all, and how it works. But that's his view. I, I, I'm not that extreme. Having said that, the issue is, there is a concern as to the application of crimes against the state in India, as it is in most parts of the world, 
because the executive is now seeking to encompass uh, forms of human conduct, which are which may be essentially uh, defamatory of the powers that be, even in the units of provinces, and bring in and impose offenses of crimes against the state. Coincidentally, today, there was, I was part of a discussion where this was taken up as to polit what, they, what is termed as political crime, though there is no such definition in India. Having said that, the issue is more important that we had a jurisprudence in the 19, late 70s and 80s where it was a liberty-oriented jurisprudence. Post-90s, post-liberalization, it changed. The the um, digression from a liberty-oriented approach towards citizens' rights is not uh, is not indicative of a failure of our uh, laws, but only an overzealousness of our uh, executive and of an uh, inadequate scope of judicial review and a philosophy that needs to be re-examined and re-looked at. We have a problem where we have decided to criminalize almost every aspect of human conduct from birth to death. And on top of that, include hardship provisions, including reverse burdens across the board, even for economic uh, crimes. And that has led to a filling up of jails and a refusal of bail because the law is structured in that way. Having said that, uh, we have also the benefit of uh, a recent decision of uh, authored by the Chief Justice, the current Chief Justice, where he said that such restrictive restrictions on bail do not bind constitutional courts and 21 is paramount. So I see that even within our court system, the approach to liberty is again becoming more sensitive and I hope that what is being done at the Apex Court will soon proliferate and impact the courts right till the bottom because it's a pyramid structure and the pyramid effect. So things should flow from top to bottom. The only thing was I wish they would do so faster. Talking about bail, one will be doing an injustice if I don't hold this magnum opus up. Mm -hmm and also read something which my, my guru, uh, Mr. Gopal Subramaniam writes on this, and I quote him here, and he says, this book, this book has thought-provoking articles in the brilliant epilogue of Professor Rupendra Bakshi, who has a Roscoe pound and whose brilliance was untransferable for many of us sums up the wide-ranging drama of contradictions in this jurisprudence. At heart lies only the constitution, the supremacy of the individual and his ability to secure fair justice, and more importantly, bail needed for access to justice and protection of liberty. The book is a much needed comment that individuals are important in due process. The constitution and its guarantees are meant for them, end quote. This book, which is dedicated by Sir to his father, to his late father, is a celebration of the law and also what the law stands for. But I will also be doing an injustice if I don't mention and thank uh, Sir for the efforts which he undertook during the pandemic to help those in the community by distributing simple things like masks. I think this is what humanity stands for. These are the values that one stands, yields, and also hopes to abide by. Those words, I thank sir for taking out time to do this on a rather busy evening. And we, we should most certainly stay in touch. And as sir says, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, thank him and also take on the mantle of improving international law with my dear friends and whose reflection I shared on Ms. Roy's comments to Shubhangi Agarwal, who teaches, who well, well, studies at Delhi Law Center and uh, is deeply inspired by the work and also offers an interesting critique and a third world critique to international law. 
and its challenges and also to my dear friend Soham who with whom I have enjoyed many evenings and also time. Thank you so much, sir. Final words and then we can close. I just like to leave you with all with the thought. Please. In 1988, there was a classic decision called Aya Elias Ayub versus State of UP. It quotes uh, Denning's speech where he said that there is uh, one cause which all judges in the King's Court must take up. And the long practice of English courts has been that if a lawyer walks into a hearing in a criminal court and says, my Lord, there is the matter of liberty, judges have left all other matters to take up the issues of liberty. I think it's time for us to be sensitive. The second thing, and I'm going to say this to you, the younger colleagues, is a favorite quote of mine from the Zafarnama, one of my most favorite books, a book penned by Guru Gobind Singh. And uh, while I don't advocate that you should pick up swords, it is like this. When all is done and justice is not in sight, it is time to pick up the sword. It is time to fight. Now for you, your swords will be pens. Your sword will be your intellect. If you as young colleagues see injustice, as we all do in our lives, it is time then to try and then to fight the good fight because that is what will protect liberty. That is what will protect our nation. Our nation is incomplete. Any nation is incomplete till the liberty of its citizens, irrespective of caste, creed, community, and religion is not protected. That's what we must do. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. thank you so much, sir. And good evening to everyone. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in for this lecture and discussion. We should keep in touch, respected, sir. And good evening to all. Thank you.